Let's begin chapter 11, substance related disorders and addictive disorders. That would be the term that we would find in the DSM for this content. So again, substance related disorders and addictive disorders. For the substance related disorders, they all involve psychoactive drugs. These are agents, or if you want substances, that can cost the brains something, something, something and affect how we something, something, or something by altering neurotransmitter release. Take a moment and see from intro psych, you can remember any of those items, any of those words that should go in the blank. These agents all share in common that they can cross the brain's blood-brain barrier, a filter system, and once in the brain, since they're psychoactive, they can affect how we think, act, or feel. Or perhaps you jot it down, think, behave, and feel. That's perfectly fine too. All these agents activate the brain's reward system, as does gambling disorder, which is also discussed in the same chapter of the DSM. You should know that other behavioral addictions, such as uh, sex addiction, addiction, shopping addiction, or even exercise addiction, presumably work through the same reward system. But that being said, the DSM does not recognize uh, sex, shopping, exercise addiction at this point. We should also note that the DSM itself avoids the term addiction. This chapter in our DSM, that of substance related disorders, has two major subcategories substance use disorders and substance induced disorders. Spend sufficient time studying this, so if you're asked, you could easily say, ah, what the two categories would be. Now, under substance-induced disorders, there's intoxication, when you're, uh, quote-unquote, high on the drug, withdrawal, having various psychological or physiological effects, and substance-induced mental health conditions, so mental health conditions that are caused by the use and or withdrawal from the drug. So again, spend a little time on the slide. It's a particularly important one. Let's consider three basic terms associated with our chapter. Intoxication. To put it briefly, it's the high of the drug. It involves reversible behavioral or psychological changes due to that recent drug use. Another term, withdrawal. It'd be an pleasant combination of symptoms could be physical or psychological. Basically, the brain has come to expect and need the drug, and these symptoms appear when that drug is not present in sufficient quantities in the brain. Tolerance, there's two ways of looking at it that are really the same. Either you need more and more of the drug to keep the same level of high, or if you take the same level of the drug, you'll find that you get less and less and less high from it. So that would be drug tolerance. On the next slide, we'll consider the major drug classes. You'll see that we have 10 in the current DSM. The DSM-5 TR version recognizes 10 drug classes, alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, hallucinogens, inhalants, opioids, sedatives, stimulants, tobacco, and other or unknown agents. This slide has a couple blanks, so first consider those and then go back and listen to the audio narration.
So substance use disorders includes both illicit, in other words, illegal drugs, and prescription drugs. The DSM doesn't differentiate. The DSM does differentiate by particular substance, whether it's cannabis or PCP or alcohol and so on. To qualify, the person has had the, have had the issue for at least 12 months or perhaps considerably longer. All these substances, and gambling also, work by altering neurotransmitter release, activating, again, the brain's reward systems. Now, in terms of the blank, the most used drug, I get all sorts of answers, but it's one that most of us will have every day. Hopefully you're thinking now caffeine. Now, in terms of the drug that's associated with the greatest number of preventable deaths, uh, no, uh, not heroin, uh, not even alcohol. It would be tobacco. So the drug of tobacco would be nicotine. Let's consider the diagnostic criteria used to diagnose substance use disorders. Uh, two or more of these need to be present. And again, this is a pooled uh, list from the various uh, substances, so not every one of these items is associated with uh, every substance. If given a test question, you should be able to rattle off five or six of these, hopefully fairly easily. Let's look at these items now. A desire to cut back, can't cut back or stop. Excessive time spent on the drug, finding it, using it, recovering from it. Using more than intended, you stop by the bar for one drink, the drink becomes a pitcher of beer and chasers, becomes the night, becomes the weekend. Withdrawing from activities and people, you used to do things and have involvement with activities and people, but now you don't because now the drug is center place in your life. Not able to fulfill your roles, consider your major roles in your life. Perhaps as a parent, uh, perhaps you take care of a grandparent, definitely a student, uh, perhaps a worker, perhaps a volunteer, so on. So not able to fulfill roles. Use impaired safety, for example, driving while intoxicated. Continued use despite very serious problems. Strong cravings, tolerance from the drug, or having withdrawal symptoms when you don't have that drug in your system. Again, two or more would suggest a problem and if you do find that you do have two or more of these in your life, perhaps make an appointment with Mrs. King, our counselor extraordinaire, and just have a little chat with her and explore that idea. After you study this particular content from chapters uh, uh, one through six slides, go ahead and test yourself. Uh, the ones you get wrong, go ahead and spend extra time on. Expect to see some of these questions on your first test. So just don't listen to the second slide, but actually use it as a study tool to help you. The two major categories of substance related disorders would be the last one, substance use and substance induced. Next question, all work by altering neurotransmitter release. The most used drug, uh, no, it's not pot or nicotine. It would be caffeine. Intoxication, tolerance, and withdrawal are all in the category of substance-induced. And in terms of the greatest number of preventable deaths, now it's not the op it's not opioids, but it would be nicotine, and specifically tobacco. But the drug in it would be nicotine. So anything that gave you trouble, go ahead and sub, uh, study it. And then later on before the next test, make sure you do this slide several times. As we now know, the DSM-5-TR has 10 drug classes. Your textbook by Comer and Comer likes to organize these into three groups. So I'll try to follow the textbooks uh, organization in the lecture notes, but again, realize that there are 10 specific 
categories in the DSM. So for our Comer and Comer text, we'll have the category of the depressants, including alcohol, the sedative slash hypnotics, and the opioids. Stimulants would be caffeine, cocaine and related drugs, and amphetamine and related drugs. And it groups hallucinogens and cannabis and uh, drugs with mixed effect in the last category. That would be include LSD, MDMA, cannabis, uh, and other drugs we'll consider later on. Let's now consider the depressant class drugs. Some students misunderstand the word depressant in this context. These are not drugs that make one sad and depressed. Who would take that drug recreationally? To depress means to slow, to inhibit. So all depressants inhibit anxiety. They make you less anxious. They also inhibit pain. So many times people will do a little self prescription or get a doctor's prescription for a depressant to help them cope with anxiety and or physical pain. They also all also cause sleepiness, which may be why you're seeking the drug, or it might have been an undesirable side effect. Take a moment and consider uh, the most used one, and then perhaps go down to the opioid category and try to decide what plant they're from. And then we'll go back to our narration. So by far the most used depressant would be alcohol. Depressants include the opioids, the class called sedative hypnotics, and of course alcohol. The sedative hypnotics are also called the anxiolytics, meaning that they are used to fight anxiety. They include the older class of drugs known as the barbiturates. And I know you want to say it barbiturate, but there's no silent R in the English language. It is actually barbiturate. And a related class of drugs, the benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines include Valium, Xanax, and many other drugs. So back in the day, if you went to your doctor complaining about anxiety and or sleep issues, you would have been given a prescription for a barbiturate. If you went in slightly more modern times, you have been given a prescription for a benzodiazepine. There's various issues with these drugs, including that they are very addicting, so they are not meant for long-term use. So the use should be typically, under most circumstances, no more than for a week or two. Let's now consider the opioids. From what plant? Hopefully you decided the poppy plant. Include many drugs, including opium, heroin, morphine, oxycodone, and uh, fentanyl, amongst others. Most of opioid addiction uh, overdoses are due to one particular drug. Which one of those? If you're thinking fentanyl, you are correct. I assume that you know that overdoses can be re reversed if naloxone is present on site or is gotten to the person via ambulance uh, quickly enough. Alcohol would be another major uh, depressant drug, and we'll consider many of these on the uh, upcoming slides. So let's consider alcohol use. Alcohol is now involved in one out of every three fatal car crashes, a tremendous loss and tremendous suffering. One in three of us will be in an alcohol-related car crash. Hopefully not as the driver, but it could be as an innocent passenger. So please be careful not to get into a car with an impaired driver. Or it could be the totally innocent person coming home from college or going to pick up their children. We should also learn the acronym DTs. Take a moment and see if you know anything about the DTs. 
other than apparently they're related to alcohol use. So the DTs are potentially fatal withdrawal symptoms related specifically to alcohol or drugs that are identical to alcohol in the brain, such as the sedative hypnotics like the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines. So some people mistakenly associate them with opioids, which is, is not the case. So again, fatal, uh, potentially fatal. It would begin with an uncomfortableness, maybe a feeling like flu-like symptoms. The person might feel weak and trembly, maybe nauseous, sweaty. Uh, their heart might start to beat rapidly. That's tachycardia. That could get to be dangerous. The person could vomit. They could go into seizure after seizure. So either the tachycardia or extended uh, seizures, as well as other associations with it, could result in fatality. If you're wondering what the letters stand for, you don't need to know it for me, but they're, it stands for delirium tremens. So this is why for some people, the abrupt cessation of alcohol use can be very undesirable because it could be potentially fatal. This is why people that are significant drinkers should go to a detox facility where that they can be removed from alcohol in a safe manner. Treatings and settings. Uh, drug treatments include antabuse. Consumption of this drug works by, after you take this antabuse drug, if you drink alcohol, you will become violently ill, and that should get rid of your desire to consume alcohol. Obviously, the person's got to be willing to take the antabuse, and many people are ambivalent about stopping drinking. They don't take the drug, and therefore, obviously, it can't be effective. Now, Trex the drug naltrexone is used both for alcohol use and opioid addiction. Basically, it helps to fill in the receptor sites that are associated with withdrawal. So it fills them uh, to the extent that the ones that are associated with withdrawal symptoms are quieted, but not the ones that produce the high. It is therefore not addicting and uh, not an opioid and can be useful. Now in terms of settings, conclude both inpatient uh, or outpatient care. Some people use self-help groups such as AA, uh, but data on AA is usually not evidence-based, so it would suggest that it's more effective than it actually is. It's definitely helpful for some people, but again, the evidence uh, is less than, um, I don't know, um, satisfying. Uh, perhaps you've seen the TV show Mom uh, that features uh, women in AA. As we learned in an earlier slide, there are many opiate drugs, of course, opium, uh, heroin, interestingly, when it was first uh, discovered, was thought to be the cure for opium addiction, it was quickly found to be very disappointing as it is, of course, highly addicting uh, in and of itself, as well as producing quite a high. Uh, other drugs include oxycodone, codone uh, in cough syrups, morphine for pain control, as well as other drugs. Let's consider now a sign of an opiate overdose. The first four symptoms can be vaguer not responsive to noise or touch. That can be anything from a heart attack to uh, any sort of medical condition that would be serious. Breathing slow or absent, obviously serious, highly serious if absent, but not specific to opioids, opioid or opiate drugs. Choking or gurgling sounds, uh, that could be uh, in a seizure. Uh, so again, not specific to opiates. Uh, lips or nails turning blue sign of uh, cardiac issues, lack of oxygen in the blood, but again, not really specific to the opiates. But the last one I think is the most telling because that is specific uh, to the opiate family drugs, P 
pupils are tiny. So if pupils are tiny in that unresponsive person, that is really yelling out opiates. Now, if a Narcan kit is available, it can be used safely. Uh, they are available without prescription. If so, here's a basic uh, question for you. Let's say that a person is uh, ODing. It clearly is an opiate. The Narcan kit is used. They're coming out of it. Do you still need to call 911? Uh, absolutely yes, because in about half or more of the cases, the single Narcan kit does not have enough medication to pull the person out of the overdose, so they will slide back into it. So yes, you do need to call 911. And next question, if there are drugs present, can you be arrested? Can they be arrested? No, there are laws to prevent that. So in that context, no arrest cannot be made. So you can safely call 911. You might think that you're the sort of person that could never get addicted to an opioid drug because you wouldn't take one recreationally. You might be surprised to learn that roughly half of all people addicted to heroin or similar drugs start with a prescription painkiller off on their own. Maybe a knee surgery, a car accident, an appendicitis, what have you, and they were given a prescription that was way too long. I was surprised when I had my hip surgery how long, how many weeks they would give me the opioid prescription, which I skipped altogether. So again, never say never and be very mindful of prescriptions. Try to go with, if at all possible, the Tylenol painkillers as prescribed by your doctor. And again, be very mindful that you don't get into this particular situation and counsel your friends and family members to do likewise. So let's consider treatment for opiate addiction. Two major medication choices are on the market at the present moment. Methadone, an older drug, it is addicting, but the person is perfectly functional and doesn't get high. So it is a good choice for many people. The newer drug and apparently the preferred drug is Suboxone. Suboxone is a combination of naloxone or naltrexone if you prefer that we discussed earlier for alcohol and buprenorphine drug used in combination this is very effective for many many people now there are options in terms of sites it can be done inpatient with follow-up outpatient often halfway houses are useful Halfway houses are now specialized specifically for opiate addiction and are often called sober living houses or recovery houses. Strangely and ironically, many will not let clients use medications like methadone or suboxone. There are local facilities such as Spark, which is associated with St. Peter's, which is suboxone friendly. So there is help out there and there's also, of course, uh, careers for people who want to work in this particular area of uh, mental health field. So now let's consider the stimulant family of drugs in many, many ways the opposite of the depressants. Whereas the depressants depress, and in other words, they slow the functioning of the nervous system and organs. Stimulants do the opposite, they speed it up. They also increase alertness, and they also decrease appetite. Which one do you think is the most used? Take a moment and consider. You're saying cocaine? Uh, you're hanging out with the wrong people, might I suggest? It would be caffeine. Coca-related drugs? Well, that would be from the coca plant, not could use the COCOA from chocolate but in the coca plant from South America. Uh, the natives would chew the leaves available legally down there in many countries. Uh, it would be coca gum, coca candy, coca tea. Wouldn't be much stronger than a Mountain Dew, if, if that, if that. 
from coca, we can have cocaine synthesized. And from cocaine, crack cocaine can be synthesized. It, although the coca uh, candies and gums, not addictive, such low levels, I see cocaine or crack cocaine uh, highly addictive. Let's consider the amphetamine related drugs, amphetamine or a methamphetamine. Go ahead and click the link. And if you have any friends or family members, any siblings that might be inclined to uh, take recreational drugs, please show them this video or a similar one. Why the pictures at the bottom? Well, you see a picture of Santa Claus drinking Coca-Cola. Did Coca-Cola ever contain Coca? Absolutely, hence the name. Uh, imagine the outcry when they changed that formula. Why Santa Claus? Santa Claus, you know, the round, uh, chubby, rosy cheeks, the outfit, that all comes from a Coca-Cola ad campaign. The original uh, St. Nick's uh, picture on the right. So again, when you think of Santa Claus, think of Coca-Cola. I probably should also mention the idea that Sigmund Freud used cocaine. Did he? Absolutely, yes. But here's the big but. At that time period, there was no FDA to say it was addictive. And he was not an American anyway. So he had depression. Using cocaine made him feel a lot better. He prescribed it. It helps his clients feel a lot better. As soon as he realized it was addictive, which was very, very quickly, he stopped using it. He stopped prescribing it and presumably had a minimal, minimal effect on uh, him as a person and his theories. So again, not try not to be too judgy. We didn't know what was addicting and what was not. Remember, they thought originally heroin was going to be the cure for opiate addiction. And we know how ridiculous that is. consider caffeine. Now any good thing can be overused and abused. Exercise is a great thing but can be overused. Uh, so can caffeine. But used in normal levels it's been correlated with an interesting combination of benefits. People who use caffeine as compared to non-users have lower rates of diabetes, Parkinson's, strokes, some cancers, and dementia. Again, this is correlational, so we can't cause, cause, say cause and effect, but correlational studies. And interestingly, people that are caffeinated make more moral decisions than people that don't. So maybe the best time to engage in business would be in the morning when the people that you interact with are probably caffeinated. So is it the new wonder drug? Hmm, perhaps. So for the people that are heavier users of caffeine, are withdrawal symptoms possible? You might know personally that yes, they are. What are some of these withdrawal symptoms? Uh, irritability, headache, tiredness, trouble concentrating, or even some symptoms that might make, make you think that you're coming down with COVID, such as nausea or vomiting or muscle pain. So any good thing can be overindulged in, so be careful that you don't overindulge. And you might find also as you age that your sensitivity to caffeine changes, so maybe you can have caffeine any time in your life if you're in the 20s. Maybe later on you can only take it up to maybe six o'clock at night, and then you might find that maybe even at four o'clock at night it might cause you issues. So be aware of caffeine use if you're having trouble symptom sleeping. It can often be a major cause or the cause. As mentioned earlier, your textbook in its organization has the heading of cannabis, hallucinogens, and mixed effects drugs. So let's delve into these categories. And you can see a picture for uh, tobacco on the left, of course, pot in the center, and uh, MMDA, in other words, XC on the right. So 
So the use of tobacco products is associated with a greatly shortened lifespan on average by 10 years. It could be anything from mouth cancer to throat cancer to lung cancer to emphysema to heart disease and so on. Picture there is a woman who is had died or was dying in this picture as a result of her tobacco use. So the tobacco plant contains 7,000 plus chemicals, which include nicotine. Now, nicotine is of course highly addictive and of all drugs is associated with the highest number of preventable deaths. So if you're a smoker or you have a loved one in your life that is a smoker, there are a lot of tools out to help you stop smoking that weren't present 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. There are quit lines so you can talk to people for free who are trained to help. Nicotine patches, gum, nasal spray, inhalers, lozenges, bupropion, which we talked about before, which is an antidepressant, uh, Chantix, which is a acetylcholine agonist, helps to fill in the receptor sites that the acetylcholine would have gone into, preventing withdrawal symptoms, and stress reduction tools are essential. Now, some of these can mix and match, for example, stress reduction and nicotine spray, but others you cannot mix and match. So you know you cannot do the patch while you do the gum and do the nasal spray, you're likely to OD. So mix and match carefully and wisely, and know that most smokers have to stop multiple times, frequently stopping for years, picking up the behavior in a time of high stress, and stopping again. So it's always worth it to stop smoking. Even if you aren't successful for a lifetime, every time you stop, you're doing your health a, a huge amount of good. In our discussion of mixed effects drugs, Let's now consider MMDA. Do you know any of the other street names for this drug? If you're thinking XC or X, uh, absolutely yes. You should know that even uh, one dose can kill. You should also know that it focuses on one particular type of neurotransmitter making neurons. Do you know which one? If you're thinking serotonin, that is correct. It damages and destroys serotonin neurons, putting the person more at risk for, and if you're thinking major depression, uh, absolutely true. And because the neurons have been damaged to the point of death of some of them, the person is less likely to respond to traditional antidepressants. You should also know that at least in some of the studies I've looked at, when administered to rodent brains, in the living rodent, of course, the neurons continue to die up until two months after each dosage. Although we can't know if it's exactly the same in humans, we would assume, perhaps justifiably, that it is going to cause a similar pattern of damage. So bear this in mind if you're considering using this particular drug. So cannabis produces the high by the specific drug that it contains called THC. Worldwide, it's the most used illicit drug, meaning illegal, well, obviously not illegal in all parts of the world. New York State uh, is, although not offering it for sale yet uh, by legal establishments, has permitted that to go forward. About 10% of the users will develop an dependence. In women, it may cause anxiety and or depression. While uh, the person is using it, it often impairs memory, especially with the problem of losing one stash. The picture below 
uh, reflects the states which allow recreational use in 2022. Uh, they would be the ones shown in the uh, bluish color. The green states are only allowing it for uh, medical use only. So some of you in this class are undoubtedly interested in being a mental health professional. Others of you might be looking more into the social work area, but again, some social workers do specialize in training and peer-wise in mental health counseling. But in case, mental health professionals do specialize in the treatment of substance use disorders. One such person would be the alcohol and substance abuse counselor. So when the narration is done, please go ahead and click that link. It's short and I think you'll find it interesting. How does one begin this education process if it's one desires specific for alcohol and substance use? Well, one could definitely begin it at SCCC, or as we now say, SUNY Schenectady. We have an AAS program at the college uh, and a certificate, both accredited through the NeuroRIC OASIS. So uh, this would be a good place to start a career focus on this, or for other areas of mental health, taking a course or two would be highly desirable. Let's look at the last disorder of our chapter. It's in the category of non-substance related disorders. Uh, specifically, let's look at gambling disorder. Time period, the symptoms have to be present. Well, it's the same as the rest of the disorders in our chapter. And what would that be? Hopefully you're saying 12 months or one year. Uh, key symptoms would be irritability or restlessness. S attempts to try to control the disorder. A person's preoccupied, spending a lot of time doing or thinking about uh, the uh, gambling issue. Chases losses, so that means when you lose, you try to get more money so you lose more and more so maybe you after you lose the day then you take out the credit card and get a cash advance or so chasing losses lying to people to cover it up jeopardizes or is actually has lost relationships jobs education or other important life features borrows money or just gets money from friends and family to get out of trouble so these would indicate a gambling issue Do all these features need to be present for diagnosis? Definitely not. The time period of 12 months is mandatory, but beyond that, a person would need four or more of the remaining features listed below the time period. For both the substance-related disorders and this non-substance-related disorder, I would caution you to be careful with friends or family members or relatives taking them to their first time maybe gambling in a casino or buying them a lottery ticket or uh, indulging in uh, drug experimentation or drug use. For you, it might be something you can walk away from easily. For them, it might be the thing that wrecks their life. So again, be careful. Uh, typical in this person's background, they often had an early big win which hooked them. Certain cognitive errors are often present. Gamber's fallacy. So let's say that we throw a fair coin up five times and it comes up heads every time. What are the chances that it will come up uh, tails? Many gamblers say, well, it's more likely now because there's, they had so many heads, it should be a tails. And each coin toss is, each coin toss is independent of the previous one, so it's 50-50. So many times they think if something comes up so many times black, then it's more likely to come up red or vice versa. Not the case. They also tend to overestimate control. If I do this ritual and that ritual and this ritual and I do this, I'm more likely to win. So they overestimate their control. In terms of therapy, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is particularly useful. And antidepressants as a supplement, often useful as well.
After you study this particular content from chapters uh, uh, one through six slides, go ahead and test yourself. Uh, the ones you get wrong, go ahead and spend extra time on. Expect to see some of these questions on your first test. So just don't listen to the second slide, but actually use it as a study tool to help you. The two major categories of substance-related disorders would be the last one, substance use and substance induced. Next question, all work by altering neurotransmitter release. The most used drug, uh, no, it's not pot or nicotine. It would be caffeine. Intoxication, tolerance, and withdrawal are all in the category of substance induced. And in terms of the greatest number of preventable deaths, now it's not the op it's not opioids, but it would be nicotine, and specifically tobacco. But the drug in it would be nicotine. So anything that gave you trouble, go ahead and sub uh, study it, and then later on, before the next test, make sure you do this slide several times. Please take a moment and complete the slide on your own. The ones that give you trouble, uh, spend a little time studying and don't forget to review it just before the test. It'll definitely help you in your preparations. So here we go, caffeine, stimulant, alcohol, depressant, PCP, hallucinogenic morphine and heroin, depressant, crack and amphetamine, stimulant, nicotine, mixed effect drug, ecstasy, H and ME, uh, barbiturates and benzodiazepines, uh, depressant, pot, uh, in other words, cannabis, hallucinogenic and mixed effects, so HME, uh, LSD, would be just hallucinogenic and uh, magic mushrooms, just hallucinogenic.